What about a book, resource, or tool that that you found useful? Uh, Venture deals. So good. I've got it on audiobook as well, actually. Who's it by? It's quite dry on the audio, I've got to say. Is it um, Brandfeld? Or yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's phenomenal. So basically, if you're... It's a Bible. It's like a literary... It's, it will teach you everything you need to know about, well, certainly American VC investing, yeah. but it's definitely... A, it is very similar to the UK as well. Um, and it tells you the ins and the outs of VC funds, how they work, how they deploy, preference share stat, everything about it. Good afternoon, everybody. We are joined today by Roderick Beer, Managing Director of the UK BAA and long-term friend of AIN. So it's delightful to have you on, Rod. Hi, guys. Lovely to be here. Um, so just to get some context, because we've been around the industry for, for a while now, um, how did it all begin for you uh, with your first sort of contact with angel investing? I mean, it happened a, a long time ago. I think I was pretty much born into this kind of uh, industry. So about 30 years ago, my dad... David Beer founded the first angel group in the UK um, and it was by, for a long time, it was probably um, the dominant angel group in the UK for many, many years. Um, I joined there and started when I was 18 and, and worked in there for, you know, um, he, he passed away about two years in, but then I carried on about six years after that as well into in angel investing, organising group, deploying about 10 million per annum into early stage companies across the UK, big focus around more kind of physical technology. So this was, this was when I was doing it probably 15 years ago. So this is kind of pre-tech explosion in London. So it was kind of more life sciences stuff and more um, and more traditional forms of funding. Um, so it's kind of started out there, I guess, um, I guess as a, as a beginning for me. Yeah, and then you, you went on from Beer and Partners, didn't you, to, was it the Ideas Factory? Yeah, so it was all about um, Ideas Factory, which is now Shadow Founder and still, still doing some really good stuff. They are kind of like online investing really it's all about bringing together great and in, great investors um, to support again early stage companies so um, it, it did about two years of those guys and it was really interesting to learn how and where and the shift and how online investing can actually work because beer and partners was very traditional it was all individual investors deploying directly into companies at that at that time as well which might bring you some context into this world of online investing the average investment per investor per deal was eighty six thousand pounds i remember doing it which mm. is across the board it's now about 20k so it's gone down by almost four times since we were investing so it's very much to see that kind of online process and the kind of way that you can actually galvanize and excite and engage with investors with a, with a fantastic start that was really interesting for me is that because there's a more diverse um group of people investing now whereas yeah, before it's it was people huge... with much larger pools of capital to, to deploy i think it was so it has, there's been a number of reasons where i think the industry has really changed and grown and it, it actually kind of exploded i guess in the last you know, I guess the last decade. Um, basically when I joined. Basically when Ed joined, yeah, yeah. Uh, things turned for the, <laughs> for the worst. best. <laughs> for, uh, for the best, yeah, for well, the best, there's the more of them, but it wasn't <laughs> the best, but no. Um, no, I think um, what, what really changed it was a, a number of things. Um, EIS and SEIS have always been a really strong galvanizer to get people to want to invest. It's a fantastic tax break. Mm. SEIS came out, I think, when it was it? Oh, it was EIS 12, first. EIS first, then, 25 yeah. years ago. So I went to their anniversary dinner, but it was um, 12 years. Um, I think it's 12 years. They SES. have an anniversary dinner for EIS. So they just they do it. Ruminate any, on. They had the 25 year anniversary dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Every year it's the anniversary. Yet another year of EIS. <laughs> was, um, Cla was Claudia Winkleman there? Claudia Winkleman. It was Roy Bremner. It was okay. not. Okay. Claudia, Claudia Winkleman was last night. Um, <laughs> no, it was Roy Bremner actually. He was really good. He was really uh, really impressive. Was but, Michael Portello there? No, he was not. Because no. wasn't he the? Mm, he was in government in charge of that role when they introduced EIS, I think. Interesting. Well, presumably it wasn't always just for, for startup related investments. I guess it was just a, an incentive for uh, SMEs of sorts, but not quite. Enterprise. It's, enterprise. It's, it's, the spirit of it is about investing yes. into enterprising businesses, so everything from SMEs and more developed businesses, but to the traditional startup. But I mean, I guess back to the to why did it grow? EIS and SES, obviously the massive tax break has been a huge benefit and kind mm -hmm. of and it interested people. But uh, things like Dragon's Den, I mean, as, as unrealistic as it is, in my view, and it is unrealistic from, from reality, um, it's, uh, it's put it in every single household everyone knows about angel investing well they call it dragon investing obviously but it was a bit of a shame that there is a separation of of <coughs> acknowledgement because sometimes yeah. like people go what do you do and i could work with angel investments and there's not immediately the no. penny drop we moment say, oh you know dragon's den it's yes. basically that but they're not dragons they're actually angels so that's, exactly. the, uh, that's how i do it as well it was really interesting when they first did the series the very first series they actually came to beer and partners when i was there oh. to say hey look we want to find some great companies to put in front of investors and we're like, okay, great. We know those are really good businesses who are fundraising. And they're just like, they weren't interested in a single one of them because they were all good, 
credible they could stand up and do a good tour you know they wouldn't crumble in front of pressure they wouldn't mm. kind of muck up it wasn't something weird and bizarre um so they just yeah. weren't interested they're just like no 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 thanks but do you think they docked the applications so that they get a good narrative out of each show yeah hugely yes. I and mean, they will do absolutely and i know i do know although anecdotally i suppose that a lot of the companies who get the funding don't actually receive the money because it falls down at heads of terms or at dd or whatever right. so it is in reality it's good tv but it's it's tv um so so in reality, it's not <laughs> reality. Yeah, or well, as you say, it, it yeah. enabled the, the it was, discussion. But it, it, it started the, the, the conversation. People understood that there is the ability to raise money from individual investors, which is really interesting. I guess another big thing and a big shift is you know the, the, the growth and rise of, of people like Crowdcube and Cedars yep. and other online investment platforms and Angel Investment Network, of course. Um, it's been, it's again, it's put it into people's homes. I mean, they're advertising on the tube, for goodness sake. I have my own views as to whether I think retail investors and less experienced investors should be deploying. I don't think they really should. I think you should be quite careful about things. But um, but at the end of the day, it's made investing incredibly easy. It's made investing, um, again, open to pretty much anyone that wants to get involved. Mm. Um, subject to trendy it. as well. It is, yeah. It's cool. I mean, you can put you know 20 quid into a brewery and talk about it down your, with your mates down the pub. I mean, the chances of you getting a return on that 20 quid is, is, is very, very low. Even if they do exit, they may not even be a return. Um, so, but it's, but it's it, again, it's raise awareness of it, I think. Which yeah. It's been really interesting. Mm. And, and I completely agree that the, the one thing I noticed from joining in 2010 to maybe 2014, 15 was that, yeah, people wouldn't expose themselves to the same level of risk per investor because there's probably more deal choice, as you say, as well. So you see more things that you like, but people would be going in 100 grand, 200 grand at a time. Yeah. I mean, which then, yeah. international investors still do, but yeah. UK investors don't. And it's less common because they have, I mean, we've got a lot more variety. I mean, you can look at, I can go online right now and look at, you know, I can actually right now invest in 200 different companies across, you know, from all across the UK. I could, why do I need to put 100 grand into one? One of the things that forced that kind of 100, why it was bigger investments and minimum investments with 25K, et cetera, was partly because of actually the cost of legals. So the cost of legals has come down significantly. It used to be a minimum of 5, 10, 15K to close a funding round, regardless of how big or small that funding round was. You had escrow, you had all the documentation on both sides of the, of the, of the fence as well to look at. And so, Again, lawyers' fees have become a lot lower. They're a lot easier. They've got things like C Legals who are mm. who are automating and digitizing that process in an amazing way. And I think um, it's it's again actually made it financially viable for a company to raise um, with nominee structures, etc. Um, to make it financially viable for a company to raise small amounts for more investors. Um, yeah, I just I just did a funding round. It cost me fifteen hundred quid on C Legals. Done. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean it's, it's and that's something you couldn't do. I remember back in, again beer and partners days. We um, Working with what was Nabara Nathanson, the now um, the now CMS, but Graham Stedman, who was the the partner, the the the, the lead at the time, we put together a, a pre-packaged legal deal where you pay five k and you get all of your legal work done. And actually, if you don't raise the money, you don't pay that fee. Actually, it was kind of a no win, no fee thing. So yeah. we kind of pioneered a, a low cost, and that was. But that's three times more than what you've yeah. just paid for a deal yeah. which was done all the way through. So and it's heavily automated then, as well. And that's in and you know, how old am I? I'm young now. That's probably what that's probably ten years ago we did that. So in ten years it's come down three times mm. and actually it's it, it's it's significantly easier and quicker. So things have just changed massively and made it easier. And what was your opinion on the there was a point where there was just a flood of ideas. It's particularly around the time I think when people were building is. apps. There still is. I mean it's it's but then there's that particular, yeah. I mean, there was, it was one time where it was like everybody yeah. just left what they were doing because the because building an app was cheap and easy, and there were still lots of specifically dating apps. Everyone was building a dating app. Oh, yeah. Every other week, recruiting apps, I think. Now, actually, yeah. I think it is yeah. it's, uh, how it changes. But um, I think it was similar it was, size market. It was overwhelming yeah. a little bit because it's kind of like, well, I actually. It was also quite early. So, what were the success stories around this market? There weren't any, so it was mm. quite all quite risky. And what's actually yeah. happening, going on? For, from from my perspective, um, our background at beers was was very much kind of like we, we didn't do a lot in the digital space. Mm. Um, we actually did a lot more around life sciences, green tech. We did a lot more around some re some retail stuff as well, some FMCG. Um, um, but we did, although we did do obviously some some, some tech. It would be more it would be more you know, enterprise SaaS would be more interesting for us. And, and I think that probably still hangs true now. To a lot I of think investors. I think so. I think it's almost going back that way it's yeah, like we've, we've yeah. bottomed out the consumer market and realized that the the uk consumer market is exciting but it's not that exciting it's not us levels of exciting we're anywhere yeah, even yeah. close and therefore a lot of the b2c propositions are well they started getting smaller investment tickets but they're giving way to enterprise technology or people who come out of industry or life sciences with something really high spec just because it might be relevant to what we discuss later but how did beer and partners work was it 
were you just connecting um, individuals with deals or was it a sort of syndication process? A bit of both. I mean, it was a traditional, it was the first angel network. So we'd know and meet and work with lots and lots of investors. We then we then work and, and meet lots of great companies starting or growing a business and then work to make the two come together. Um, and you would take a sort of a broker commission? Yeah, brokerage, brokerage commission, okay. kind of average, which is still the industry standard now, really, is 5% yeah. um, in finder's fee, really. Um, so it's pretty straightforward as a model. And we work quite hard to build ad hoc syndicates across investors. So it wouldn't just be one group of investors always investing together. We'd be finding lots of different investors, placing a lead as part of a deal, um, and then making sure um, that other investors come in alongside them as well. We probably did, we did about 10 million a year, we probably did it for about, for about 50 companies. So so decent kind of average ticket size, decent average kind of amount raised mm. for a number of companies too. Uh, we, you know, we were successful only half the time roughly. We're probably yeah. 50% success rate, which I always see as generally the industry average. Anyone above a 50% rate of being able to close out a deal is doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, being very selective or is, yeah. Or the definition of, of being successful could be a very yeah. small ticket now. You could I just mean, get a quick 20K in and call yeah, that having successfully we raised. We didn't. I mean, we never did that. We, yeah. we you close around because it, so back back then, yeah. I mean, oh God, I actually sound like I'm really old. I'm actually only uh, in my early 30s, but I sound <laughs> like I'm really, really old. But back in the day, um, there was, where was that collaboration? There wasn't that cross collaboration. It was beer oh. and partners were the, the the largest angel group. There were probably only two, a handful beneath us, and they were half the, less than half the size. And so, how would you get a? How would you then go out and get other funding for across a, across another deal? Yeah. If I raise twenty five k here now, well, where's the other four hundred and seventy five? Yeah. Where's that coming from? Yeah. Um, and it was a it was a much less developed ecosystem of the world back there. So it's even harder to find investors. Um, which is why kind of beers, I guess, stuck out quite a bit. Um, Did you have so, good so, investor so we, so loyalty? We close. Yeah, we course, yeah, absolutely. Because that's the thing that sometimes we've experienced is that every three to five years we'll have a very different pool of investors whereas I imagine back in those days you, you no, kept the same guys no you, well you did but investors burnt this is the thing this is, a, this is an issue as a trade body well I guess we'll come on to UKB a bit in a bit but um, this is the, one of the issues people, people just invest too much too soon they don't take it easy um, they don't always keep hang back with more money so we had you know, great investors who are really loyal, but once you've invested your money, you're not investing again, you're done. Yeah. And it often, from an investment point of view, it's high risk stuff. And so they think, well, I'm gonna put, you know, quite a bit into my, into this, into this de-risk fund, I'm gonna put some money into that, I'm gonna do some property, do some some, some renewables and whatever, um, and I'm gonna save a little nest egg to do some stuff around venture, because it's really fun, and I like to get involved. And then once that's used up, it's it's gone, and they won't, yeah. they won't they're not, they're just sitting back and waiting for returns. Um, and I think that was an even bigger issue back in back then when the minimum investment per investor per deal was really high. It meant that they would be putting their money, say you got half a million to drop, they'd be putting it into to you know ten companies and or maybe even less, sometimes like five companies. Um, which is great, but actually you need to have a portfolio of ten to fifteen to get mm. the returns in on average to really hit the star performers as well. So um, as a bare minimum. So it wasn't really it was even harder for them to get returns in a way. Well, um, it stops the follow-on allocation for them because what you need is once your front one is doing well, then you need the, the extra capital to back it to, to stop getting to lose returns losers. across the board. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. you have to. Um, which again, and we, and we did have a lot of investing, a lot of follow-on funding as well, which was great. Um, but we found, generally speaking, I mean, it's not angel investment that you guys aren't doing anything wrong. It's just the fact that investors they invest within the first couple of years. Yeah. Mm. I think the issue that we used to see a lot, and it's something that I'm really keen to to, to stop people doing, is the, I should call it the first year burnout. They come in, they get excited, they drop all their investment in the first year, and they sit back and wait for returns. You know, EIS, you know, it's now eligible after three years for exit. They go, oh, where's my three year exit kind of thing. Mm. It happens a lot more with those investing who are less professional with investing. So you might see some of that um, online as to those who are, who are less experienced in investing. Um, but it's, a, it's an issue because, you know, you should be taking, it's not a it's not a sprint. It's a it's a marathon. It's a long term yeah. thing. Exit seven to seven plus years. I mean, you'd be lucky to get an exit in seven years. Yeah. To be honest. Um, did you did you get many exits? Yeah, we did have quite a few over the over the period of time. Yeah, we did absolutely, um, but nothing cool that you would have heard of because it wasn't in well, life consumer sciences, facing yeah. digital tech. Yeah, yeah. Life yeah. yeah. but they get some so, huge exits. They also have. I mean, well, that's what I kind of say that the original unicorns, right? I mean, they they're doing. You know, you keep you hear all, this, all the digital tech unicorns. Life science, the original. I would say they have a very long gestational period. Yeah. Some of the companies that we raised money for at Beers ten years ago are still raising money in quite popular platforms now. I see them and go, well, "Actually, I've got, we've got, I've got shares in those guys. Yeah. Still, I've got options in those guys. They're still going around because it takes so long to commercialize a, um, their IP." Um, yeah. Which is interesting to see that that ten years on, and I'm still seeing beer and partners deals knocking about and <laughs> doing some good stuff. That's the that's the the pension pot, right, for you? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's waiting. Well, we, for... sold, we actually well we sold out. Actually, we sold out most of them. We got a few bits and bobs here and there, but. Um, we actually sold out the family business. So we, the, the family 
we owned about sixty percent of the business, um, and then we sold it out to to Luke Johnson of Risk Capital Partners, the, the yeah. um, Peter Express um, um, of Peter Express, Strada, etc. Fame. Um, so we actually sold out to him many many years ago. Um, I continued for about a year or two after that, and then then moved on to, to Ideas Factory. Is it still going? No, there's still some doing stuff. So mm. there's a few splinters of the old beer and partners group still doing things together. And I actually later joined one of those sub splinters called Rafina Capital after Ideas Factory, oh, right. who were boutique corporate finance house, all about raising for kind of half a million, but no- normally that kind of Series A stage. And they're still doing great. I was their COO. We, we built a platform. It was really they're still going, do some really good stuff, and, and it's really exciting what those guys are doing. They're they're moving up from from angel investing now more into Series A and making some really good deals. And how did you find yourself um, managing the UK BAA? Uh, so, I, so I joined, so I left Rafina and joined UKBAA about three years ago um, and, and worked to really help, I guess, grow and build the community and support that community. It was kind of a little bit of poacher turned gamekeeper situation there, mm. going from, from corporate finance into, into trade body. But I absolutely loved that shift. For me, it was fantastic. It was your job is to help build and grow the ecosystem for everyone to help them all benefit from it. So I really enjoyed that, actually. Um, and worked from there really... Um, you know, I guess I'm a young lad, but I had at the time 12, 13 years of experience in angel and early stage investing. Because um, you started from 18. Because I started from when I was 18. Yeah. Right, straight into then worked all the way through for that period. And I although think- I may not have 18, I didn't have 15 years of experience because you don't have, you know, you had a lot, you get a lot of experience um, in doing that. Probably not full 15 years because if it's the same thing for two or three years, you're not getting experience. But yeah. um, but no, it was it was quite a while. And so just really, I guess taking. I guess my relationships, contacts, and, and background into into the trade body to help really build around a lot more focus in supporting angels and angel groups as well. Yeah. Because I think running, growing, and starting an angel group is, as Ed, as you guys will know, is incredibly hard. Um, we've now got seventy angel group members. We had a lot less when I joined. We've helped formed quite a few as well um, because they're important. Uh, and one of our big things at UKBAA is that if you're investing in early stages you must be investing as part of a group, never on your own. Again, it's that one year burnout. Yeah. Get in there, start investing and then leave it. You should be part of a team, part of a group, investing across a larger number of deals over a longer period of time. And and can we, at this point, just to anybody who isn't clear on what it is, define the <laughs> yeah. UKBAA just yeah. in terms of how you give like a, a very short synopsis of it? Yeah, so UKBA stands for the UK Business Angels Association, slips off the tongue. Uh, my email address is the longest in the world. Um, <laughs> but it's basically with a trade body for early stage investing. So our job really is to help support all those that are deploying capital at early stages, but also those who help them looking for funding too. So we work with accelerators, incubators, universities, government agencies, um, but our big focus is around supporting the investor community. So that's individual investors, uh, angel groups, online investment platforms like you guys and and many others besides, um, but also um, early stage VCs, EIS funds, SCIS funds, anyone that's kind of putting cash into companies at pre and post series A is our role. And as a trades body, does that mean you're government backed? No, we're not. Have, we're, we're completely independent. So, so what we does it mean trades body then? Trade body, work. You, you represent the association, so our job really is to help. So what does it, yeah, what does it mean? Um, what it means is it's our duty, I guess, and our role. We're actually a membership organisation. So we're run for and by the members. Um, we're not for profit. We're limited by guarantee. We have no government funding other than the occasional project we might deliver on behalf of government on a on a procured basis we don't actually get some core funding to help us thrive and grow um, so we're totally independent so we run by the members so the members who are the angels the angel groups it's our role to represent them and do what they want us to do to support them so we do lots of events to help them build better connectivity mm. we run an online investment platform which helps completely for free which allows them to share stuff with each other we do uh, lots of research we've got a big piece of research coming out um, on Monday in fact cool. which is the the next um, British Business Bank survey we do with those guys to around the angels around the angel investing. So you, if 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 you're listening and Angel Investment Network will almost certainly be sending out an email um, about it, won't you, Ed? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. To support the research, and we do a lot of government. Um, we do a lot of work with government too. So we we yeah. Do do you do you go and get a seat at the table to we lobby we change right, you lobby we yeah. fix we saw where we need to. Um, we've got a round table with Bayes coming up next week. We've had a number of round tables with them as well. We work to solve the issues that are there for the industry and, and try to fix them. And that's kind of our job. So we're mm-hmm. doing lots of work around diversity at the moment. We've got yeah, a, we've got a number of um, of events and um, pieces of work that we're doing to help grow the number of women who are investing. Mm. 48% of the UK's wealth is with women, but only 10 or 15% are actually angel investing. So there's a, there's a huge disparity there, which we're trying to sort out. Um, are you, uh, what, uh, what are you finding while trying to sort of engage in that process? Like what, what is holding people back from 
um, or having more female investors? I think it's. I mean, we work. It's a. It's. We did a big, a big piece of research, which was funded by um, um, some European Commission money, actually, to find out what the barriers are. And there's a whole host of reasons as to why. One is an educational piece. Yeah. Women just aren't. Um, they're not being made aware of it either through their IFA their financial advisors aren't really telling them about angel investing mm -hmm. because they don't think it's for them it's they have a perception that women are more risk averse and won't be interested in angels um, I think another thing is um, financial services the financial industry in the UK and insurance and legal is a huge industry for the UK it's always been we're one of the world centers for all those um, for insurance for finance and for and for law um, and those ecos, those industries typically understand equity. They get it. They know investing. They know finances. And it's mostly men. Mm. Um, I don't know what the stats are, but at senior levels, I, su I suspect there's a, there's a lot of guys. Um, and so you'll find that they they make money. They do very well in their industry, and they have some money to invest. And they are naturally averse. They, they are naturally inclined to. to they, they understand this kind of um, this piece as well. Whereas women tend to be making money in, in more creative industries. Not always. Absolutely not always. There's some amazing women doing some great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, uh, in the main, they tend to be in, in more creative industries. It could be where, where, where there's not constant and natural exposure to early stage and venture and high risk investing. Um, and presumably that has a knock on effect for the, the number of uh, female entrepreneurs. It does. And is that something that you guys concern yourselves with? We concern so ourselves with it, but there are a lot of others doing it too. We're yeah. a small trade body. So we've said, look, we are going to one of the ways that we can help support more women entrepreneurs is by having more women investors. So yeah. we're going to focus on women investors. Um, yeah. We do quite a bit of work with Innovate UK and others around diversity and supporting women entrepreneurs. We, When we have run pitching competitions or training events, we do a lot around um, how we support women specifically to make sure that they can they get the support that they need to be able to, to raise investment too. So we do quite a bit there, but we, as a, as a small trade body, we're let's focus on the investor mm -hmm. side of things and mm -hmm. try and fix that part of it and let others deal with the entrepreneurs directly. And so is it an education piece then? Huge education and awareness, um, to be honest. And it's a long-term game as well. It's 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 going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult to rush because, as you've said, beer, beer and Partners was started 30 years ago. And that yeah. gave groups of, of wealthy men a chance to immerse themselves in that environment for, for decades mm. before it became what it's become today mm. and we're expecting it to happen within sort of two three years and no. we need to catch up but I think it's just going to have to take time because as you say with the exit starts going to come through for seven to eleven years so even if female investors invest today they're not going to see if it was worth their, their risk for maybe a decade for so doing it. and then also talking about their successes when they do get the success right. coming through absolutely so it is a long-term game I'm not expecting any overnight things but as a trade body our role is to is to chip away at that is to fight those good fights there's still I think there's still more education to be done on making people aware of SEIS and EIS as well I still yeah. speak to people in the city who don't know what that is so that always surprises me um, pff, yeah <laughs> yeah I mean our risk, yeah absolutely I mean maybe they're not then also deploying into early stages when they get to understand that I mean we found that 86 90 percent of investors are using that scheme as well so mm -hmm. Um, it's a phenomenally successful scheme to, for those who are deploying in this stage. I mean, they're not, you're not, not going to use it if you can. Um, it's to the point but, where yeah. it's actually scary if it got taken away. Yeah. Another thing I saw, I saw an interesting stat where actually there's quite a lot of comp a lot of the businesses don't understand EIS and SES and aren't familiar with it, particularly those uh, um, um, in different outside of the outside of London uh, and the Golden Triangle. They don't really get, they don't really understand angel investing as much as well. So there's a big educational piece around for the companies too. Um, do you find actually on that note that you spend a long time, a lot of time, supporting groups and organisations outside of London? Yeah, because I guess the, the London ecosystem is yeah. really so well we've developed. Got a, so we've got, so we've got, um, we've got a number of things that we are focusing on. One is around diversity and improving diversity, not just gender diversity, but other diversity too, um, to its truest sense. But we also look at. Um, the regional disparity. I mean, seventy percent of the equity is deployed in in companies and businesses based in basically the Golden Triangle, mm. you know, that kind of Cambridge, Oxford, London's kind of um, area. But seventy percent of the businesses are outside of that triangle. Yeah. So mm. there's a huge mismatch. And they all qualify two. for SES. They and the all qualify AIS. for SES and EIS. Um, <laughs> and sometimes regional funds. Um, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of regional funds out there, and we've actively yeah. worked with helping to deploy and, and 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 get them out there. I mean, the regional angel investment. Um, Regional Angel Program by BBB has just announced its first group where they've got a hundred million pound pot to invest and deploy alongside angel groups that are based in in and outside of London and the, uh, of the Golden Triangle, um, which is um, you know it shows the government can see the need for more early stage investing outside of that area, um, and it's a big issue for us. We need to make sure we have 
amazing businesses from across the UK accessing the capital that they need in order to grow and be the you know the SMEs which are and hopefully bigger but well there's SMEs been big the, tech tech migration for instance up to Manchester I know a lot of people push their yeah. teams up to Manchester because it's cheaper and so there'll be naturally ideas that spin out of places like that 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 need local funding they don't need to be funded by people in London and it isn't there um yeah. Bristol is another am- amazing example you've got Graphcore we've had some amazing stuff happening around bioscience as well the guys at Xylo who exited after four years for 650 million quid some, wow. some very bright lads who came out of out of the university there and, and and have done incredibly well um there's a there's a huge number of and this is what we're seeing we're seeing an explosion of tech of, of technology clusters across the UK you know some great things happening across the, ha- happening across the country um in reality, a lot of angel investors tend to invest quite locally. Mm. Um, they tend to 70% of the time they stay within their own home region. And if for all these businesses, um, often the only form of funding available to them because they are not trading is angel money. Even the grant funding they, they can receive um, has to be matched with angel. And so even the, the government backed funds are often matched with angel. Um, so you'll find a lot of the, the regional funds are there to be matched alongside other investors. And so if you don't have those investors on the ground, not only can you not get the money you need, but you can't unlock the cash that's already been put there for you. So it's so the investors really are a really important part of the the kind of funding ecosystem for the whole of the UK. Are you pretty encouraged by what you're seeing from your efforts? We are absolutely. We've done some. Uh, yeah, we are. It's again, it's not a, an easy thing. Um, also, I'm I've been in London. Well, I've been in London for for all my life, um, for most of it anyway, and so. Um, it's it is very different to to going out into Manchester into Newcastle into other areas of the UK because it is just there's just no way near as much out there in terms of investors in terms of community as you have uh, in London I mean it's it's a very different place um, but I think the work that we're doing so far has started to pay off we've got many more investors now engaged and doing more out in Bristol and Manchester we opened um, we've now got six angel hubs across the UK an angel hub is basically a co-working space that investors can use and drop in and access and we run mm. workshops and training workshops about how to be an angel investor so we've now got six we're in we're in we're in we're, in, we're just about to go into Newcastle we're in Manchester we're in Leeds we're in Bristol we're in Belfast we're also in Cambridge and London for, for some of our other you know um, some angels that we already know and we're looking at expanding that out which really helps to to put angel investing on the map within those regions and to help galvanize and grow more investors around around those places um, to hopefully support more companies. You mentioned earlier that you like to encourage investors to invest as groups. Yeah. Is that part of the message that you're promoting to these people? Absolutely. And like, how, how does a syndicate get formed? Um, good question. How does a syndicate, syndicate get formed? Normally it's someone has, it normally comes from one person. They've made some money, they might have exited a business, they've sold their own company. And they're thinking, well, you know, actually, I started my business from angel funding, and I want to start doing the same and give back. Um, and then they start to chat to their friends and those others who are doing pretty well for themselves and have built up a bit of wealth. And they go and they take it from there. And they think, well, actually, yeah, we should all do something that'd be interesting. Well, actually, I made my money exiting a business in this certain sector, so why don't we have a look at that? I, I think I'd be really good at spotting a good business mm. in that sector, and I think I'd be really good at helping them, given them, given that I've made a load of money there and I know a lot of people. Um, so let's kind of do something around there, um, and it kind of starts from there, I guess. It's a bit of an idea and a bit of a bit of a passion. It's, it's quite a certainly earlier on. It's definitely a hobby. You know, it's a bit mm. of a hobby approach. Mm. It's not like straight in there, professional deployment of capital and managing and you know managing risk and etc. It's not. It's 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 about having fun and giving back no, and enjoying like- yourself in the process. Um, and there's a lot of that. I think it's, our role is to help them professionalise to make sure they get good returns. Yeah. Because they get good returns, they put it back into angel investing. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an, it's a, the research shows that the more, there's some really interesting research, it shows that the more investors, the longer they've been investing, so the more experience they have in investing, mm. the more they invest. So those who are investing for more than five years invest significantly more of their capital than, than those of less than it. So, so the more you do it, the more you do it. Yeah. The interesting thing is that when they make exits, um, a very large portion of that money you, that, that, that you have a, as a return goes back into angel investing. So you kind of, the more you do it, the more you do it, the yeah. more you do it. <laughs> is that because so, of the capital gains? It's because they, it's not a tax thing, it's because they love doing it. It's because it's exciting. They've made, it's like a, you know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to get involved in. When you have some successes in that space, you want to carry on doing it. So, so we find that edu- by educating investors, they'll, they'll, they'll be more confident to deploy more. 
um, by making sure, by educating them, they'll be have a better chance of getting good successes and returns, they'll be able to deploy more. So, Because mm. um, you've done this, um, I think, is it a video course or is it a course called How to Be an Effective... Yeah, the Effective Angel Investor, effective yeah, angel. which we're doing. Yeah, so we got... So that's... That's that's another way in which we're trying to help build and grow angel investing across the UK is, is through that educational piece. Yeah. And it's an eight hour course, six to eight hours, um, with lots of about twenty one lead angels who've all been very successful in their own in their own um, in their own lives, um, talking about their story of angel investing, how they do it, going through how does the tax breaks work, how how can you get involved in this space, the do's, the don'ts. Um, so hopefully de risking it for some people anyway. Um, so that's been going for about a year now. We've had about 160 investors, if not, I think, yeah, probably about no, fact, nearly 200 now, um, completing the course. Which is great because there'll be the spread of word of mouth from each of those investors as well who will then seek to educate people they also talk to. Um, what I find pretty interesting about what you're doing is there is a, a, a belief I have that a large number of angel syndicates can offer a genuine alternative to VC. I think if there's enough of them and they can formalize and they can be pulled together some some of the people are are pulling together you know a million quid pretty easy yeah and and that's a very powerful alternative to there are three or four groups who are deploying over 30 million pounds per annum yeah. into early stage companies as an angel group um yeah that's some seriously big hit if you look at an average vc fund they probably deploy what 30 40 percent of their fund you know they're com- you know they're competing with a 100 million pound fund and they're but they're deploying 30 million every year it's new fresh money they haven't got to re-raise a fund um, so you know, there's guys like Eviction Investment Partners who are doing a huge amount, although they're a bit, a bit later stage. Twenty Four Haymarket, Archangels. Yeah. There's quite a few who are seriously uh, Cambridge Angels, of course, who are doing a, a lot of investment too. Um, that is absolutely competing with, or and often alongside VC, alongside yes. uh, VC funds. And and they also, because they're out there in the market, get access to the deals probably earlier than some of the VCs, or they're willing to invest often earlier than the VCs, so they invest in the SEIS, EIS run, and they're still there when it needs to go through the next stage of the journey. So it's it, it's interesting between them and corporate VC and current VC and where they're all playing, it's it's definitely moving around and changing and will continue to change, I think. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good, really good point. I think one of the things we worry about, again, coming back to making sure that angel investors get their returns, is ensuring that the VC funds that come in and, and, and get involved, that that preference share stack doesn't become too ominous where the angel investors who are actually taking the real risks at the beginning don't get their returns. Um, so there's a bit of an issue there sometimes when VCs are are trying to do too much to to hedge the risk off a little bit. Well, I imagine seed legals will be playing their part in educating entrepreneurs on the way through the term sheets yeah, to understand where those hiccups yeah, come. absolutely. Um, and we do quite a bit as well because we want to make sure that the entrepreneurs also retain good equity all the way through. Don't take, don't give away too much equity because you're not incentivized to take it through. So, so yeah, absolutely. Do you see any any real common term sheet um, no nos that you think are real issues that people are putting? I think um, I think we do in, from the entrepreneur point of view. The, I, think, I think entrepreneurs tend to go in with a pretty straightforward, reasonable term sheet. I think investors sometimes get a bit try and get a bit cute to try and hedge off too much of their risks. Things like being able to push a company into liquidation if they're not hitting their returns purely so that the investor can get can liquidate and get their EIS tax mm-hmm. break. I've seen some of that come through. Um, I've seen investors trying to take too much control of the business. Why bother? Leave it to the entrepreneur to, to run and grow their business. Don't try and do it yourself. If you want to do it yourself, do, do it yourself. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why well, do that? Put the money in, let them do it, and, and, and have the sleepless nights and eat bees and toes for, for three or four years. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a few things that we do see that are more common, but it's, I think generally speaking, we see you know the angels are pretty a pretty reasonable bunch in the in yeah. the main, um, which is good. But I think there is you should absolutely read up if you're looking if you're an entrepreneur or an investor deploying or an entrepreneur raising money. You should absolutely read up and what should be right. The, the the kind of the rule of thumb we apply. There's loads of ways to, to from a valuation point of view. It's just you give away roughly about about twenty percent at each funding round, and your funding rounds de- defined by how much money you can probably ra- reasonably raise from investors. Yeah, and that sets your, that sets your valuation. It's a kind of a good starting point from which to to move up or down on really. Um, and we see, you know, we do see people trying to take too much. You know, forty percent. I've seen someone trying to take sixty percent of a business for some investment. And I thought, why? Why on earth would a as an entrepreneur you give that away? And why as an investor would you want that responsibility? Um, and how are you going to? The big issue there is when an entrepreneur grows and, and, and starts to look for institutional funding, the VCs won't get involved because there's not yeah. enough in it for the entrepreneur. So, so yeah. 
And so in terms of, of getting money from the government and your, your involvement with them, is that a decision by the UKPWA to say, look, we are going to be impartial, we don't want government money, or is it government not providing the funds, or, or will that be something that happens in the future? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's about, we were, th- there was no conscious decision. The way it founded, actually, and Beer and Partners was, one, was probably the first member of UKBAA. It was actually founded by, by another angel group, um, by Angel Capital Group, which run... Um, London Business Angels many, many, many years ago, and we joined them as well. It was actually it was actually the industry coming together in its own right. We thought, let's come together, let's make something happen. Um, I think it was originally managed to raise a bit of money to get it going, um, and off it went from there. We've just never really needed government handouts, to be quite honest, to make us go. But I think also it's nice to have that impartiality and to stay, you know, it's very hard to... You know, it's very hard to, to lobby and fight against a government that pays your bills in a way, um, mm. if that makes sense. So, because you've got you've got strong ties to the mayor of London, for instance. Like you guys yeah. are in there in the um, I can't remember what the building's called, but you know, you're, you're there. Yeah, City Hall. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I mean, so, so yeah, we do, and that's but that's rather than it being there, it, it's it's about doing, it's about raising awareness and building profile for yeah. those that need it. So we're doing, so we do we do work at the mayor of London in, in it's called Tech Invest. It's a really good program. Great event. As um, well. Yeah, so it's all about showcasing some of the best tech talent that London has mm. in and around the the city, and, and kind of showcasing that to investors. And we've raised a lot of investors, invested in a lot of companies, and, and done a lot of support for them as well, which has been amazing. Um, and actually, we're looking at extending that and expanding that outside of London as well, um, which I think is is a great thing. And it's it stands. The whole point of that is about building awareness of great businesses doing great things. What is Sadiq's um, position at the moment on startups? I mean, is he excited? Is he- He's hugely supportive. We've got the yeah. new London Fund that's come out. There's also, I mean, from from we, we do quite a bit with with his office and and also the the deputy the, the, for business Rajesh Agarwal, and they're, they're hugely supportive of the work around here. I mean, they understand that um, London is an incredibly important hotbed of innovation. Um, I think it was ranked number three in the world for starting a business, which is phenomenal given our size, uh, although a bit lower for scaling a business, but but, but it's, a, it's an amazing city and they want to maintain that. What's the prevailing view, if there is one, on Brexit and how, mm. how Brexit is going to affect that? Uh, it already is, in a way. There's been a bit of a slowdown in investment, although not huge amounts, but people just kind of like are sitting on the fence a little bit. We're seeing investors are going a little bit de-risking themselves by investing bigger amounts in, at, at later stages. So yeah. rather than doing small amounts in the, in the risky stuff, they're being a bit more risk averse. We're seeing that as a bit. Um, I think one of the issues was always being about access to talent as well. Um, are we going to retain and maintain the talent? I mean, if you go to any pitching event in London, yeah. you know, half, probably two thirds of the founders are, are, are from you know European. They're not. They're not. They're not. They're not English, um, they're, and they're amazing. They're phenomenal. Yeah. We're attracting such amazing people from across Europe because of our ecosystem and because of our, you know, our environment for funding and supporting and growing great businesses. And if that was to be significantly, I mean, it's going to have a. I think that's that's my. That was always our biggest worry. I think when you look at the tech teams as well, probably even more. Huge. Like the amount of, of Huge. yeah, people who are rush and what you know, it's it's but all parts of the. You know, the, it's amazing. I mean. You know, it's kind of a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit cheeky, but I think London does really kind of strip some of the cream of the crop from across Europe around uh, yeah. the talent for for growing, building businesses, whether it's a tech talent or whether it's you know CEO talent, but um, which is a little bit unfair. But that is going to be, it already has been hampered, in fact, by this, um, by 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 this, which is. Will there be a contingency plan? Do you think is no, it? No, no. So you guys, <laughs> is there just, any plan? No one knows. Yeah, no one knows. And and would you see it, um, an environment where some of these, so, so some of the tax incentives will continue to change and evolve? Um, something we talked to or spitballed in the office was maybe that if we really want to be seen as the home of sustainability or SDGs, that maybe we'd up the SEIS allocation for something that was sustainably accredited to maybe two hundred two hundred fifty k to try and further incentivize you know green transitions like can you could you see government being willing to make any further changes or are they i think they would exp- yeah i think so i think we, I, I often get asked is eis and SES going to stand going to stay and i think it absolutely will it's, yeah. it's it's the darling of 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 i think we, people are jealous of our tax structure um will they increase seis it's something that we're interested in doing i think the 150 seis cap has led to lots of small funding rounds um, people, you know, doing their first funding round at 150k just for the tax break, which isn't enough to to get you to the next milestone to raise another round. So um, we're interested in whether it's linked to a green agenda or not. I think it's interesting in extending the the size of SEIS to to two two fifty. We've had a few members who are interested in doing that. So I think we'll again as a trade body, it's one of the things that we will work on. We'll put together a paper and take it to take it to the right people. I think it'd be highly effective. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's still incredibly high risk companies. They're, only, they're, they're no more than two years old. So this money is going into businesses that are that are, that are seriously innovative and, and doing some great things and need that cash as well. Well, even if there was an interim at 40%, between 30% of EIS and you know and it just was allowed for 300k I, I don't know what the maths would be on it but <laughs> you know just something to keep it you, the momentum because because fan is we become, need a new acronym I don't have one <laughs> I don't have one that's the where you come middle in middle enterprise and <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, because yeah I, I think um, we're, we're getting all the information and the data and seeing it all play out and it's becoming very stock in terms of a funding round, it'd be 150k for give or take 10 percent, and so it's like one to 1.5 million. It's becoming a very sort yeah. of bo you know boilerplate uh, approach to fundraising, and I think it's it's maybe a little brittle in that sense, but it's a good it's a good enough. In sense yeah, of I think so. I think 150 isn't enough to get. The, the, the fact of the matter is, your funding round is there's it needs to get you. It needs to be sufficient to um, to grow the business and achieve enough to be able to raise another funding round normally twice the size of the one you've just done mm. so your, your next one will be will be 300 after that it's 600 etc and you keep on going until you're ready for series a and you're, and you're tracking pretty well in terms of kpis but um you know that's what it comes down to and 150 doesn't really get very far i mean it's still friends and family round to be honest mm. what well, seed eagles do they have the, the instant investment facility whereby in the terms for your say 150k round you can set an additional investment term for like to the next 12 months where you can continue to accept money mm -hmm. without opening a new round and but on, yes. on, on the same terms yeah and yeah yeah so that was something that that, that, that the trade body actually originally um, um, uh, lobbied for so before really? you had to close your you had to spend 75 percent of your SES money before you yeah. could even raise EIS and go for the next round um, and draw that down so we actually lobbied for a straight transition from SES to EIS so that you could actually do that. Um, but I guess the next step is probably just in extending SEIS as well. Mm. Um, in terms of in terms of the landscape as you see at the moment, um, how do you feel about our exits? How do you feel about where we're going to continue to be strong and perform? I think we're going to be, um, I think the UK, we are way ahead of the field, certainly for Europe, for fintech. And it's always been a very strong piece for us because we're great from technology point of view. We've got some great minds coming out of our universities, clashing with a, the, one of the financial centres of the world in London. Um, so fintech, we're incredibly strong with, and that's always going to be, and it's growing now into reg tech and other areas too. So I think that's always going to be um, a strong sector for the UK. Life sciences again, deep tech, we're very well known for as well. Um, I, um, IQ, IQ just raised a, a massive deep tech fund as well, which is really great, but mm. driven by some of the some of the talent coming out from our universities as well. So, so I think they're going to be key areas for to look out for. Okay. Just going back to the to the angel investor side, if I if I've made some money and I want to get into angel investing and maybe I live in somewhere regional, mm. what would be what would be a first step and then a second step? Or good, good first steps. The good first step would be getting in touch with UKBAA. I mean, our role is to help give you some a better insight and understanding about how to angel invest and how to not do it in a way where you're going to lose all your money in a ridiculous way. Um, but we're also help to introduce you to the right people on the ground. So mm -hmm. local angel groups that you may not have heard of, um, yeah. accelerators, incubators, doing cool stuff down there, just to kind of get you in touch with other people, meet up with other investors. Mm -hmm. um, you need to build up a friendship network when you're investing because it's uh, it can be a tough old job. So. Having others that you can bounce ideas off is a great is a great asset too. So that's what we'll we're, you know we're we're a good first step. Yeah, it sounds fun the idea of sort of meeting up as a group maybe absolutely. once every three months with a bunch of like minded chums yeah, to yeah. just to chew through some some deal flow and put some entrepreneurs through their paces yeah, as well exactly. and see how they get on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Be yeah, a dragon for a be day. Be a dragon for a day, <laughs> although hopefully not nicer. Be an angel dragon. Be an angel, <laughs> an angelic like dragon <laughs> for a, for an hour. Yeah. Um, and do you find that they they have these social aspects to your angel hubs? Yeah, off the, the angel hubs, yeah, yeah. they do. Um, yeah, absolutely they do. And I think it's also about, um, it's also using it as a centre for, for for events, for education too as well. So it's also about learning and about getting deals done, not just it's not just sitting around drinking drinking free beer, which is always tempting. Hmm. Yeah, because I think the, the presence of angels in the area also will take hopefully some young entrepreneurially minded kids um, and give them a direction to steer their education towards or feel that they have opportunities outside of just you know maybe whatever they've grown up into so I think I think that'll be really important in transitioning 
young people in those areas as well hopefully yeah I mean it's, angel investors are not just about the money they're also about the, the experience the expertise and the support so it's not just about and that comes back to that whole making sure there's investors locally because they're investing and supporting local businesses if they're not in the same area they're not going to come and you know they're not going to be able to meet you for a coffee and chat through and sit on your board and look after you and go um, so we're, we're quite big on on angels purely because they also bring the expertise and advice and guidance and help these young entrepreneurs to, to grow and to thrive can you see us ever rivaling the envy of, of Silicon Valley, San Francisco? Uh, yes, I can. Maybe not to the scale, but proportionally. I mean, for a start, we did about £6.9 billion in equity um, this year, which is a record. We've grown 70% in two years. Mm. Our growth rate is outstripping that of Silicon Valley as well. We're doing some amazing stuff in the UK. We're still very small, um, but we definitely punch above our weight, certainly. Um, but um, America's got at least 10, 15 year jump on us and they've got a lot of exits and a lot of noise out there. So mm. we'll, I don't I don't know. I think you'll find um, we do very well for our size as a country. Um, <laughs> we do pretty, some pretty good stuff there. I think we are from a kind of, you know, from an exit and growth point of view, if you look at the overall returns in equity, again, but US versus Europe, it's that they're converging, they're averaging the same. Um, so we're actually doing really well. The difference is our spread of losses and wins are much tighter. So we have smaller wins, but we also have lots smaller losses because we're, um, we're not being as bullish in our investing um, at equity stage. So it's quite interesting, but they are converging. And I think they might actually have converged. I'm not sure what we are now. Yeah, it's because China, China's market's picking up a pace. Um, but then there's also curiosities in the American market as well, like the, the WeWork IPO that may now not be an IPO because it's seen to be so heavily inflated. So within that envy, well, there's also... The price, weren't they? They're going to uh, do it for 20 billion or something. Or yeah, it? so that they can get these massive exits, but at, at what cost? Because it's, it's ultimately it's been passed on to the, the people who pick up these post-IPO shares and then just get screwed. Mm. It's, I guess, you're just passing on to the retail investor to make mm. a buck for all the, the people who got in there first. Mm. Which is not longevity. That's yeah, we're not as big at IPOs of it. We, we, a lot of the, generally speaking, the exit certainly for an angel anyway is through. It's not through an IPO. It's more through trade sales mm. really being snapped up through there. Um, that tends to be much more common for, for 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 the industry that we see. Well, especially after the AIM market wobble back in 2013 yeah, yeah, or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah which I think eroded some confidence. Have you made any investments other than the ones that came through Beer and Partners? Subsequently, only yeah. a couple, but small ones because mm -hmm. it's. Um, um, I've got feel the pain. Expensive, feel expensive the pain. business. It's expensive business, and I've got three young children, so uh, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're even more expensive business than <laughs> yeah. a, a house in London, which is even. But worse. a better return. <laughs> but a, but a, a, but a, a better but return. An excellent return for my children, and hopefully they'll put me through my nursing home when I'm older. That's the whole, <laughs> and or and or let me a kidney or two when I when I burn through the ones I've got now. So that's the plan anyway. Um, but yeah, I have yeah. Yeah, let's do the, let's do the, let's do the um, the dose. So do you have a prediction for the future from us, for us? Uh, a general prediction for the future, I reckon uh, in 10 years' time, I think we'll still be going to Brussels begging for an extension to, uh, to, uh, to, <laughs> to Brexit. I think that's going to be happening for, for, for 100 years. That's life a, now. It'll be, that is our life. That's life. Be, that's just... There'll be like a pageant basically in 200 years' time. We'll be wondering, why do we have this, this strange thing where we all travel out to Brussels and ask for some kind of extension? To, and then retract. To Brexit, and then... whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll be doing that for, for a long time. Um, I think, um, but I think for, from an industry point of view, I think we'll see more verticalization from an investment point of view. So mm. more angels, more investors focusing down on sectors they know well rather than being kind of generalists. Uh, and we've seen like Green Angel Syndicate, who another mm. another angel group who, yeah. are who, who are focused. There's a number that we've helped form as well. So we'll see that, which is good. I think we'll see more professionalization for angels and angel groups as well, which is great. Um, we're obviously very encouraging for that. And we've seen this growth in guys at 24 Haymarket, Archangels and many others besides who are who are deploying some serious capital and managing it just like a VC fund, but still bringing in all the benefits you get from having lots of angels engaged as well. So I think we'll see some, some interesting stuff. Do you think with, the, with more exposure, like smaller investments, more portfolio investing, more data points collected and more people active, that it becomes more of a genuine asset class? Yeah. I that do. we can rely on I for do. returns. I think it's still very difficult to track all that. All that. I, I, I do. I genuinely do. And it is actually a genuine asset class, to be honest. It is. But and as you say, can, sometimes it's, 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 the story it's goes, it's led by hard. emotion. But yeah. that's I believe, with the amount of data points we collect at AIN, that it stands to reason that this could be a genuine asset class, which could be tracked, which we can tighten the spread on because we're getting more information. Yeah, we're seeing that. And, and online investing is helping that massively. I mean, we, there is... Massively, um, I mean, you see all the all the investment platforms. They know exactly what it was bought for and what it's currently valued at, although it's on paper, so they can track those data points as well. And same for you guys, and that's definitely helping to fuel. The more data that we get, the more we can we can we can move towards it. It's still difficult. Mm. I mean, you still 
I think um, some of the guys like Bohurst track a lot of the equity deals, but I think only half of it is is disclosed. Um, so of, the, of that six point nine billion, only about three and a half billion was actually tracked, and they know, and it's been disclosed, and they know what it is. The rest is undisclosed equity, unknown. Could be anything from anyone to anywhere. How can it be clue. undisclosed though? Because it's not been made public, so you can't track it. You can only get some certain amount of information yeah, from the company's house. Um, and so there's I still a long way to, to go. I thought you had to. There's only so much you can get from it. Um, so a lot of the time, you'll see a lot of the deals being done. It's unknown investors, undisclosed investors, unknown, unknown. So it's there's a long way to go in gathering more data about who's deploying where into what. Um, in my view, we're only we're only well, we're only halfway there. It sounds like from 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 Bohurst Tat's point of view. But um, mm. I mean, they're doing a phenomenal job to track what they do, and and they do get some good data on the stuff that isn't disclosed. But it's still a way to go. Yeah. yeah. Because because we see a point where we need to couple up with Bohurst to give them transparency over our part of the you know the, the yeah. value chain, and so until that's done, for instance, we yeah, could give them hugely. loads of these points. Yeah, the big issue that we see is a lot of our angel members and groups they're, they're not they're not telling anyone about it, so they're not being attributed to the deal, so it's just going in as unknown. So we all have to help and give in this data um, to really help build a better picture of what's what's actually happening, and to help, as you as you put it, become a, a viable asset class. Mm. What about a book, resource, or tool that that you found useful? Uh, venture deals. Mm. A book. Have you guys amazing? Have you, has anyone mentioned that on the sh- on the show? No, no they have not. It's venture uh, deals. Well done. Um, it's the first. It's amazing. The it's, thing. Thing. It's, it's amazing. Unreal. So good. I've got it on audiobook as well. Actually, Who's it by? it's quite dry on the audio. I've got to say, is it um, Brad Feld? Or yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's phenomenal. So basically, if you're, it's a bible. It's if, like a literary. It's, it will teach you everything you need to know about. Well, certainly American VC investing. Yeah. but it's definitely a, it is very similar to the UK as well, um, and it tells you the ins and the outs of VC funds, how they work, how they deploy preference share stat everything about it so yeah. I'd absolutely recommend oh, cool. if you're looking to raise a funding round you may not need it so much for an angel investment point of view but certainly if you're coming close anywhere near a VC round um, then I'd be looking at venture deals so if you're an angel out there and you're a you, you want to run and deploy a bit of VC fund on your own get in have a look at that it's amazing so it's venture deals Brad Feld yeah that's it's right. exhausted yeah. like buy, you can either have it in ebook in hard is Copy? there something like seventeen hundred pages? Or ridiculous. Or actually, there's something one like that you also get access to the online resource and download templates for, yeah. for, sh- for 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 stuff as well. So I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Actually, well, actually that's a short one. Then there's a, there's a venture hacks or something, which is also like a long similar thing. But it's yeah, it's an unbelievable resource. What about the best advice you've ever been given? Uh, I guess it was probably when I was as a good mate of mine actually, and I still stick to it. Uh, is is especially if you're a startup or an early stage. Or, and if you're a bit younger as well, I'm an old man now. Um, <laughs> you, um, keep, you keep oscillating between saying that you're young and you're yeah, old. You're well, not sure. I feel old. I've got three young boys, <laughs> um, so I feel very old uh, and broken. But I think um, the big piece of advice I've given is probably just, is just say yes. If you're starting a business or growing something, there's a lot out there that's going to be daunting and worrying. And you're going to think, oh, should I do this? I've been asked to do this, or I've been told to do that, or I've been given this opportunity. Should I do it? Or I don't think I've got the strength or the skills to do this, or I, I think I'm up to it. The, the the rule of thumb is just say yes and worry about that afterwards and just work it out. Um, yeah, that's been a big thing for me actually. Is is if yeah. you get things like oh I don't know if I can do a podcast I'm not sure about it at all and um, Ed gets in touch just say yes that's it. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. And you've enjoyed it. You look like you've enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it's good fun. Yeah. I think it's all good fun. It's just chatting to you lads anyway. So exactly. Fun. Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm going to insert a little question here. So, grand ambitions for maybe where you are personally your career in the next ten years. Would you go into government? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I'm. I don't know. I don't. When I go into government, I don't know. It's a very different world. I would say that. Um, we work with quite a number of people from government, and they're amazing. But I'm not sure if I've got the mindset. I think I'm quite. You could just say yes. <laughs> I just yes, I will. Just say yes, <laughs> I will go into government, <laughs> and I will run for something important. <laughs> for, for visiting Brexit each year <laughs> yeah, to deliver to no be, Brexit. Yeah, to go on the Brussels uh, booze cruise to, <laughs> yeah. to get our extension. You know, exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and one final thing we'd like to ask before before we wrap up is if anybody listening could do anything to help you um, on your way, uh, what would that be? Uh, well, I think, you know, we are, our role was to help build and grow and connect all those that invest at early stages. So if you're, if you're, I guess, um, so we're always interested to speak to people who are investing and who are thinking about investing to give them some insights as to how and where to go. Um, uh, we've got a lot of, we, if, you're, if you're looking for funding, you're more than welcome to go and check out our uh, member directory. It's the most comprehensive list of, of investors in the UK and it's free and it's open. So if you're looking for funding, go and have a look at that as well. Um, uh, yeah, so I think we'd love to hear from people who are investing, deploying, those who are also trying to support entrepreneurs, mm. so accelerators, incubators. We do quite a lot of work with them in, in helping their 
their um, community to access investors too. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute delight. Me. Really fun. Thanks.